So welcome. I'm excited about our event today. We've got Dr. David Vigorous. He's a good friend, but he's also a world-class uh, immunologist and laboratory scientist. He's faculty at uh, Vanderbilt, and he's very much involved in the COVID uh, pandemic right now. Uh, he's done a lot of work in terms of um, uh, testing. He worked with, uh, with the uh, consulting group that, uh, that I developed early on that was working with KPMG for uh, helping employers understand the impact of, um, of COVID on their workforce. Um, David's here to talk about several things. Uh, some of the testing that he's, uh, he's working with now and that he's been working with recently. He's also uh, involved in I'm Aware the lab group that, that I've been talking about recently that does home testing. But a couple of the major things we're going to talk about has to do with genetics and immunology. For example, they're finally beginning to understand the risk that may be coming from our genetics. So if you think about it, we know for sure that comorbidities and age are clearly major risk factors for getting into COVID-19 if you get coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So there's two different things. Again, SARS-CoV-2 infection is just an infection. Most people don't have much of a problem with it, but a lot of people, both young and especially old, get very serious infection and die. Now, what's the difference? Why are some people just getting a cold and some people are dying? Um, Again, of course, uh, age is a big issue. Comorbidities, uh, prediabetes, uh, obesity, these things are big issues as well. But there's some genetics in there that I've often wondered. You see it with, uh, with other viral infections as well. And yes, today we're gonna cover that. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is skip over some of this information. The bottom line is that we've got a lot of content out there and available. Uh, we can help you discover uh, undiagnosed prediabetes, uh, help you understand why you uh, may have a positive calcium score, and a few things that can save your life. So, uh, yes, we've got that kind of information available, but let's just uh, skip over that for today so we can get right into our discussion with Dr. Vigorist. Um, first of all, let's talk about, let me just present, David, uh, real quick, some of the basics on this. Um, uh, this in, Actually, let me back off just a second, uh, and let's talk about you for a second. Do you mind if we giving us a little bit more about your background? Uh, sure, sure. So um, I've done the majority of my training in the areas of infectious disease. So I did some early training in microbiology and immunology back in Texas where I grew up. Then I came to Nashville, Tennessee, went to Vanderbilt and did my my, uh, my doctoral work. At that time, it was for the most part in, in the innate response. So our natural born uh, immune response to viruses and in particular to HIV. So we share some common ground there in having spent some time doing HIV research. So our, our really interest there was to understand how our body interacts with the virus, whether it's HIV or, or in later work, I went to St. Jude, spent uh, a couple of years there in a fellowship looking at influenza viruses and how those influenza, influenza viruses interact with our respiratory tissue, with our lung tissue. Uh, followed that up with another fellowship back at Vandy in pediatric infectious disease, and then stayed on faculty. And I've been full-time faculty, and then now in recent years, I've been adjunct faculty, uh, still with a very strong interest in infectious disease, respiratory viruses, immunology, and then now, you know, getting into this realm of laboratory testing so that we can better understand who's infected, who's, who's already been infected and has recovered, and then how do we go about protecting people in the future with a vaccine or with, you know, therapeutics? So give us about 30 seconds to a minute on your uh, research in terms of um, central nervous system inflammation. Well, a longstanding interest of mine has been what happens in the brain when it comes to inflammation. So a variety of different 
different disease processes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Uh, but really the area of interest I had was in the development of tumors within the brain and whether or not our immune system plays a role in that. So does uh, an overactive immune system in the brain result in exposure to these cytokines? And we'll talk about these cytokines, I'm sure later today in, in relation to COVID. Oh yeah. But the exposure of those cytokines can sometimes lead cells to, to go off the rails. So instead of being a normally functioning cell, that that intense exposure to this inflammation can take take them down a path towards you know developing into a tumor, and because of the way that the brain is is sequestered from the rest of the body, we don't get you know as opposed to the rest of our body, we have a, a, a lymphatic system that bathes and washes and removes toxins and you know does a lot of maintenance work for our tissue that doesn't really happen so much in the brain. So that closed environment that we have in the brain means that you have much more intensity from these different molecules that may lead to brain issues, whether it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or tumor, for example. So yes, we will be talking about some specific genes that uh, appear to uh, set people at at specific risk for that cytokine storm associated with COVID. Yep, again, we will we'll cover some of that. Now, uh, if I look in the background, I think you said you're sitting in a hotel room. Is that right? Yeah, down in New Orleans. Down in New Orleans. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing there? Um, we have a laboratory down here in New Orleans. So um, the last week I've been validating some new kits, some new ways of testing folks for, for COVID-19 infection. And they're focused around lateral flow devices. So these are small, kind of easiest way to, to think about them is like a pregnancy test, a home pregnancy test. You put a couple drops of blood or saliva or urine, and it reacts with the components in those samples, and it tells you if you're positive or negative. What we've been working on is a way of taking saliva from someone who may have had an exposure and placing that onto the lateral flow device to find out if they have the nucleocapsid antigen of the virus. And then if they do test positive, then we can follow that up with a confirmatory PCR. So that's the gold standard that we've seen in the testing industry for COVID the last year was PCR, looking for the genetic material of the virus. PCR? Polymerase chain reaction. In other words, basically taking the um, the genetics uh, of the virus, amplifying it, and or the genetics that you pick up, amplifying it, and making sure that the virus genetics are or are not there. That's right. Right. It, PCR is basically a copy machine for nucleic acid for genetic material. So uh, it just allows us to amplify it. Right. So it's a technique that's been around for thirty years invented by a very interesting character named Kerry Mullis. Um, and it's been, you know, the workhorse in molecular biology and in testing for the last 20 years. So when people get COVID testing now, they get an immediate test, which is more of an ELISA or genetic, uh, I mean, an immunologic test. And then the confirmatory test is the PCR, right? Right. Because we have 99% sensitivity and specificity with the PCR. It very rarely ever detects incorrectly. And the reason for that is because we designed primers in small bits of, of DNA that bind to a very specific place on the virus genetics. So because you have that specific target, it, it's unlikely that we'll recognize one of the more common coronaviruses, for example. So, you know, we, we survive or we live every year with four common coronaviruses that cause us to have just a cold, you know, respiratory, respiratory issues that are fairly minor. Because they're all within the same family of viruses, there's always that risk that if you don't design those very well, you pick up, you cross react and you pick up other viruses. And we want to avoid that. We want to be able to say you have COVID-19 or you have, you know, a typical cold virus uh, from one of those other four family members. COVID-19 is the black sheep of the family. Uh, yeah, well, you got two other, two other, you know, cousins, 
MERS, which yeah, occurred. Right. Yes, exactly right. Good MERS point. Occurred a few years ago, and then the original SARS one back in uh, 2003. And uh, as humans often do, we got a great warning with those two other cousins and didn't do a darn thing yeah. about it. Yeah, we should have been a little more vigilant. Um, the research community and the medical community has for probably 20 years warned about such an event yeah. because we see this on a regular basis throughout the world, not just not just in Asia, but all around the world when we start getting into different habitats, there is the risk of something crossing from an animal reservoir into humans. At most of the time, it ends up as a, a dead end. We're just not a good host for most things. But occasionally, it finds a way to survive, as this one has. Did you happen to read Osterholm's book, The Deadliest Enemy? I have, yeah. That was a great quote. I think it was the, the intro quote uh, on Chapter 13. It came like thunder across the bay from China or something like that. And he was discussing this happening about two, what, two or three years before it did. Yeah, and, and this kind of thing has happened from, from China and from Asia a dozen times in the last hundred years. Uh, it, it happens frequently. It happens the more we move into spaces where humans didn't previously, you know, go into. HIV was a similar situation, right? Yeah, um, but not from China, just from a different yeah. part of the world. That's what I mean. I mean, this happens all over the world. Um, and anytime we get into close contact with a reservoir, whether it's a bat or a, a civet cat or, you know, whatever, there's a chance that something crosses over. Speaking of cousins and animal reservoirs, one of the um, one of the the cousins of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is um, has a huge reservoir with the camel. Uh, population. Which one was that? That's MERS. MERS, yeah. So yeah. it's it, it's interesting. I mean, is there not uh, a lot of danger that MERS is going to uh, break out again? It's always possible. Um, it all depends on the circumstance in which you're exposed, right? So in yeah. in places where where you have bushmeat, for example, you're you know commonly exposed to the pathogens and in, in whatever it is that's being you know, butchered for, for food um, you know, and a respiratory kind of infection like we've seen, you know, most recently, it's always possible to for that to reignite itself and come back again. The, the difference it has been in the past, though, that those had a fairly high fatality rate. Yeah. So you're looking at, you know, 30 percent and above 30 percent, just as we saw with with pathogens like Ebola. When it has a very high fatality rate, it doesn't have a chance to spread far and wide because it it unfortunately kills the host before it has a chance to spread. Yeah, thirty percent uh, mortality rate is not a good thing for a virus. You're killing no. off your your chance to spread. Right, and the original Ebola had a ninety percent fatality rate. Yeah, uh, back back in the early seventies. So those kinds of things, they're very poorly adapted to us as humans. So they run wild. And you know, it takes viruses typically that survive are the ones that don't kill the host. And they don't make the they don't make the host extremely sick, right? Yep. The virus wants, I mean, not to give it a, a human quality, but the virus wants us up and mobile and moving so we can spread to other hosts. You know, I'm smiling because I knew that you and I were going to both end up going down a bunch of bunny holes. But, you know, these bunny holes take us back. Like uh, the past couple of weeks, I've covered this issue of the um, the new variants and strains coming out of UK and South Africa. One of the, um, the points has been, look, guys, every uh, – Every viral pandemic that comes out so far that I know of anyway, has done the same thing. It gets out, it gets started into the human population and all of them are going because of the the junky way in which viruses replicate themselves. They have to borrow all of the the replication materials from the host. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of junk in there and there's going to be a lot of um, mutations, a lot of variations that occur. The typical variation 
is going to be one that has an advantage in terms of spreading. And as you and I just talked about, you tend to get an advantage in terms of spreading by killing your hosts less, causing less disease, being more, uh, more spreadable. I think right. the jury's still out on these last two, uh, two variations, the UK variation and the, the South African variation. The other thing is mathematically and epidemiologically, even if you get significant decrease in uh, disease and mortality, um, that's still not likely to to overall be a good thing because it's still going to looking like it's going to continue to overload our public health and hospital infrastructure systems. Mm -hmm. Any comments on that before we get back to the uh, to today's topic? Oh well, yeah, no, that, that's right. You know, viruses want to try to come to a place where they're in some balance with the hosts so that they can achieve their their desire again to spread to a new host and to keep propagating, right? The, the biological imperative of just about every organism is to reproduce. And that's what the virus wants to do, right? Um, yep. And it's entirely upon, uh, it's relying entirely upon the host, us, uh, chicken, the dog, whatever the host is to, uh, to help propagate. And these new virus variants that we're seeing right now seem to have a much stronger affinity to the receptor, which means they bind tighter, which means they have a higher likelihood of getting into the host cell and replicating. Uh, that also may mean that they, they cause disease more frequently or more severe disease until that balance becomes, you know, until you get some equilibration between the virus and the host. You know, this, this is a pathogen that's never been in humans before, this particular one. And if you go back to the 60s, when the first coronaviruses came out, or if, were not came out, when they were first identified, they probably had a higher rate of, of sickness than they do now. Yeah. The 1918 flu, you know, I mean, sickened and killed a, a vast number of people. But we still have that same variant. We still have the progeny of that virus circulating with us now, and it doesn't cause us hardly any trouble. Yeah. Except people who have you know, severe underlying problems. So the, the virus will eventually get to a place where it's more in balance with us. And it's unlikely that it's going to be gone forever, even with vaccination and all we're trying to do. And to your point, it's not, it, there are two different gene pools that are, that are adapting to this relationship. The human gene pool, you know, a lot of people died uh, but it's not just the human gene pool uh, changing in, in adaptation to this. It's the virus gene pool, probably even more so, mm -hmm. changing to make itself uh, not more virulent, less virulent, so it can spread more. Right. And, and they have much more opportunity, right? Because a virus replicates, you know, a million times. You know, it goes from one to a million in right. a matter of hours. And, you know, our replication time is, is decades. 50 years, you know, so they have much more opportunity to, uh, to find the right combination. Right. Yep. So it's almost like, you know, pulling a, pulling a, a you know, a slot machine, you know, every time it, it, that thing rolls, it comes up with a association, not an association. It comes up with a, um, you know, a structure. Well, is that a good structure or a bad structure? The bad structures get dis you know, discarded. The good ones get a chance to recirculate again. And every time they go through this cycle, they're trying to find a better, better, smarter way. So speaking of which, and pulling us back to COVID, um, remind me, I think it's what, every two weeks or so, we're getting a new generation. Two weeks to a month, we're getting new generations. And what is it? Every two generations, uh, there's likely to be a significant mutation and variation. Have I got that right? That's right. Yeah. So let's go back and uh, get back with the program. Uh, Gilbert or uh, Aspen, could you give us a water ball or something to transition us into the slides?
So David, if you would, feel free to uh, to go ahead and interrupt as I go through the slides. We've just, uh, as usual, Chris has prepped uh, uh, the slides for, from the articles uh, that we're talking about. And um, there's some real pearls in here. Uh, this is from Nature Magazine. Um, Genetic Mechanisms of Critical Illness in COVID-19. Researchers are still trying to understand why some people infected with SARS-CoV-2 become severely ill, while others have very few symptoms. Scientists have turned to genes of patients to understand how different bodies mount different defenses. On December 11th, 2020, a GWAS study, Genome-Wide Association Study, by a group called Genomic um, was published in Nature, pointing out five key genes that can explain why some people get severely sick with COVID-19. I think I am gonna have to stop for a brief bunny hole real quick because this term GWAS, Genome-Wide Association Study. Um, David, you and I talked beforehand, You know, there's a couple of concepts that we probably need to take a a quick detour just to explain so people don't stay stuck on them and try to get uh, try to get oriented to it. A genome-wide association study, speaking of getting your head wrapped around it, the first time I tried to understand a GWAS or genome-wide association study, it took me hours. I got, as I often do, way too wrapped up in the details. I think one of the simplest, easiest ways to understand this is if you, um, if you look at the entire genome, then you can start saying, okay, there are, certain, there are certain people in this population, the population of people that ended up in the ICU from SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then there's the rest of us. Uh, are, what genes are appearing much more often in the, in the group that's in the ICU? Any uh, any other clarity that you might want to add, David? That sums it up really well. We'll do the same thing when we get to the concept of Mendelian randomization, another one that just sort of can twist your brain around unless you're unless you take the time to simplify it. Researchers analyzed the DNA of 2,734 patients in 208 UK intensive care units. That 208 is significant because it's not just some variation. Uh, that they happen to be looking at, uh, you know, a small uh, uh, gene group. It's people all over the UK. They compared this to match controls who did not have a positive COVID-19 PCR test on file. Now, when I saw this last comment, I thought, well, wait a minute, shouldn't they be comparing it to people that have had infection but didn't get symptoms? Well, as we go on a little bit later in this uh, presentation, you'll see that that's exactly what they're doing. Um, right now, they're looking at a couple of different populations. One is the general uh, uninfected population. Information's already available through uh, th groups like 23andMe and some uh, genetic uh, uh, databases in specific to the UK. Now, what they're gonna be doing, and you'll see this in our uh, little video clip that we show later, they're also clearly wanting to be able to compare uh, what they're finding to other people who have had COVID-19 infection, but did not get symptoms. So thought I'd go off script for a second just to explain that. Now they have, a, they have identified eight loci or loci, depending on how you pronounce it. David, do you use loci or loci? Loci. loci. Okay, so I'll, I'll yield to yours, uh, your, uh, I'll just yield to your pronunciation. Loci, where variants were more common among the intensive care patients, five were in genes linked to the immune system. I'm gonna list those genes, don't get too wrapped up over the technical terms. All they are is just some uh, location uh, specifics. IFNAR2, TYK2, OAS1, DPP9, and CCR2. If NAR2 and OAS1 are related to innate viral defenses, it's important in the early stages of COVID-19. If NAR2 encodes a building block of a receptor for interferons, interferons act as emergency flares to warn the immune system of an intruder 
and have been a target for researchers hoping to develop a COVID-19 treatment. OAS1 controls a protein of the same name. It's involved in the body's response to viruses. Now, the other three are related to host-driven inflammatory lung injury, which is a key me mechanism of late, life-threatening COVID-19. TYK2 and CCR2 encode proteins used in cytokine signaling. Remember the cytokine storm? The cytokine drives inflammation and can lead to lung injury. So as David mentioned that when he was talking early about his research in terms of um, inflammation in the central nervous system or the brain, we were also talking about Obviously, the big uh, difference in terms of danger here is our own immune reaction. And again, these are some of the genes that are popping up that are showing, you know, most of them are loss of function genes, I think, David, and we can talk about that in a few minutes. Anyhow, I'll get back to the script. DPP-9 encodes an enzyme with diverse intracellular functions, including the cleavage of a key antiviral signaling mediator. These findings are significant. They could open up new approaches for treating COVID-19. Obviously, if you know someone has certain um, uh, loss, of, loss of function genes, uh, you may be able to supplement that function to keep them from developing this cytokine storm. Our results immediately highlight which drugs should be at the top of the list for clinical testing, said Kenneth Bailey, one of the researchers and a senior fellow at the University of Edinburgh. For, ex for instance, the researchers team found that a boost in the activity of the NFAR2 gene could create protection against COVID-19 because it's likely to mimic the effect of treatment with interferon. One potential treatment, a multiple sclerosis drug called Rebif, is a similar approach to giving patients a boost of interferon. Researchers also showed that a reduction in the activity of TYK2 gene protects against COVID-19 a class of anti-inflammatory drugs called JAK inhibitors, which includes Eli Lilly's uh, baricitinib. Uh, easy for me to pronounce, huh? It produces this effect. Now, let's switch over for a minute and cover a quick slide on uh, COVID testing. Again, an area where not only, David, are you an expert, you are uh, very, very much involved currently. In fact, as we said, you're in a hotel room in New Orleans uh, traveling as you work on uh, COVID-19 testing. The UK coronavirus variant may cause some false negatives on certain molecular tests, according to the FDA. However, tests that rely on multiple regions of the genome may be less impacted than those that only rely on a single region. Three tests that may be specifically affected are the Ac Acula SARS-CoV-2 by Mesa Biotech, the TACPATH COVID-19 Combo Kit by Thermo Fisher, and the Linea COVID-19 Assay Kit, Applied DNA Sciences. However, the FDA said that the impact on the Acula test does not appear to be significant. Moreover, the last two target multiple genetic elements, so no risk of false negative is expected, at least at this point. Still, the FDA encouraged clinicians to consider any negative results in combination with clinical observations, patient history, epidemiological information, and to do repeat testing using a test with genetic target, uh, different genetic targets. We're gonna show this brief, uh, it's about a minute, minute and a half video on the genomic study that we talked about, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. The Genomic Study Our genes play a role in determining who becomes desperately sick with infections like COVID-19. The Genomic Study, based at the University of Edinburgh, is aiming to find the genes that cause susceptibility to COVID-19. Identifying and understanding these genes will help us to choose treatments for clinical trials and help provide better care for patients. To do this, the Genomic Study is working with over 170 hospitals across the country to obtain DNA samples from large numbers of COVID-19 patients. 
Many of these patients are also participating in other COVID research studies and we would like to thank everyone involved for their continued hard work and dedication. The DNA sample is normally provided in a small amount of blood. Once taken, this sample is posted back to Edinburgh using boxes provided by the genomic study team and the DNA is analysed. The study is currently focused on the most severely ill patients, those who end up in intensive care. But we also aim to recruit people who have milder symptoms and those individuals who have recovered from the infection and have been discharged from hospital. If you are responsible for R&D in a clinical setting that is not currently running the genomic study, please do get in touch with your LCRN study support service lead or contact the genomic study team directly at genomic at roslyn.ed.ac.uk. The more patients genomic can recruit, the better the chances of being able to identify genetic features that can lead to somebody becoming desperately ill. So, uh, before we get started with the Q&A, David, I want to open it up to you to, uh, uh, in case, again, we touched on a couple of areas where you've been doing a lot of work, especially the lab area. But again, as an immunologist and geneticist, let me just remind folks, you and I met each other when we were both working for James West at My Genetics, a, uh, a very good uh uh, genetics lab and program. So uh, you got a lot of uh, genetics in your chops as well. Any comments about either of these before we open it up to comments and questions? Yeah, one of the one of the things I wanted to mention about those five genes that were found in that study is four out of the five are related to the production and the signaling of interferon. So you know the IFNAR is a receptor for interferon. The uh, TYK2 is a tyrosine kinase. That tyrosine kinase plays a role in the expression of a variety of different cytokines. So we've talked about the cytokine storm. OAS, that other, that other gene OAS is induced by interferon. And then CCR2 is a chemokine receptor that is also regulated in one way or another by the cytokines. So the central theme for every one of these genes here with the exception of DPP9 which incidentally has a role in the development of diabetes and, and plays some role in, in glucose metabolism, is related, related to interferon. So interferon is a natural produced, naturally produced uh, protein, chemokine, cytokine, uh, by our innate, by the part of our, our immune system that we were all born with. And the things that we typically feel when we have the flu or a virus, like the fatigue, the headache, the fever, the muscle aches, those are all signs of interferon release. So when you when you feel fatigued and you have the back pain and the achiness and the headache, uh, in some ways that's actually a good sign because it means your immune system is working. It's producing interferon in an attempt to, to fight off the virus. But those are things that we typically associate with as uh, having a bad connotation, right? It's like fever is a good thing to a point. Um, the fatigue, all, that, all of those things that you feel when you get infected are a good thing in the respect that they're telling us our immune system is working. Problem here is that they get dysregulated, right? You don't produce enough interferon or you don't produce the receptor to engage the interferon or you don't produce the protein that's regulated by interferon. So the central focus in, in this paper, from my read of it, is a inability to properly use and, and produce interferon in a fight against the virus. A comment and a question. The comment is for the viewers. Now I think you may see why I was excited to get David on board. He is just a, uh, a wealth, a database of uh, information that at first may sound a little bit uh, unique or even trivial, but once you start digging into it and listening, you begin to connect dots that make a big, big difference in terms of our understanding of, of what we're dealing with. So thanks for that comment. The question, David, is um, 
You know, I had often suspected, you know, this thing about taking aspirin or uh, antipyretics, anti-fever drugs uh, after you get a vaccine. I had often, I tend to be a, well, as you know, an, an old country boy and I grew up a major believer in no pain, no gain. Um, and I al always suspected this practice of taking uh, an uh, anti-fever drugs in relation to vaccines. I had never seen any evidence that it actually did decrease the response to vaccines, but saw some recently. Have you have you seen any, any of that yet? Uh, a little bit here and there. What did you recently see? Oh, it was, again, some uh, evidence that, you know what, you may get some decreased uh, long-term uptake of your immune response to vaccines if you... Uh, if you're using aspirin and Advil and the other, the yeah. other antipyretics, suppressing your immune response, you're suppressing right. the very thing you're trying to to enhance. So the bottom line on that is, when you get the vaccine, if you can take it without taking the uh, aspirin or Advil, do that. Do that. Yeah. Give your body a chance to mount the response it needs. Like David said, uh, a whole lot of that has to do with in interferon and a whole lot of that has to do with uh, your own immune systems developing the memory that it needs to recognize this problem when it comes back. Yeah, and this is, this is exactly the reason why people say, well, I got the vaccine and I got the flu because yeah. they get the symptoms. Right? They got the symptoms that they associate with the flu. Those symptoms actually come as a result of the interferon release which is a good thing. Yeah, that's so, exactly right. Right. So, you know, when someone says, well, last time I got the flu shot, I got the flu. Uh, actually, unlikely that that's the case, unless it was just kind of a, a, co a coincidental exposure about the same time you got the shot. Your body hadn't had a chance to fight yet. But for the most part, those those symptoms that we associate with, with sickness, um, when we get the shot, which oftentimes is a subunit, it's not even a virus right. that could cause infection. It's just a fragment or a piece. And that's what these are as well. They're just a fragment or a piece of, of the virus intended to give us enough information for our immune system to respond. That's what always comes to my mind when he whenever I hear somebody say, oh, I took it and I got it. You know, they, what comes to my mind is, again, like you said, most of the flu vaccines are very similar to these vaccines for COVID in that it's for the outer shell because the shell is what your body's going to recognize first. And my perspective, what goes through my mind is, you know what? You got an introduction to the outer shell. You did not get an infection and therefore a huge, uh, a huge response to this. Uh, the fact that you got some response is a good thing, and it, you just you're clueless to what you could have had. Mm -hmm. Right. And th the other comment was going to be about the testing. Um, those three tests that you you referenced there, uh, they they typically look at multiple targets within the virus. So the Thermo Fisher, for example, Thermo Fisher has already released a statement saying that there was a high likelihood that their test was not going to pick up the new variant spike. And, and we've seen that in practice with patients that we've tested recently, where there's a total drop in the spike protein. The advantage to those tests is because they're looking at multiple genes, we, we require two positive results out of the three that we test to call a patient positive. So even in the absence of the spike, if we can still get a good signal from the other two genes, we can still diagnose that as a positive uh, SARS-CoV-2. So given where you are and what, what we're talking about, do you have, what, what action uh, can people take away from this? Uh, are there specific tests that they should avoid for now or should they not worry about it? Well, I mean, if you can, if you can not avoid, but be watchful of the tests that are based on the spike protein entirely, so every one of these tests that's out on the market, uh, the producers and the laboratories that design them pick different targets because they feel like that target is representative of the virus. So some, some labs look at the envelope protein, 
Some look at the nucleocapsid, which is the shell that encases the genetic information. Uh, some, you, you know, some look at a matrix protein, some look at an, another larger protein called ORF1AB. So if you have a test that's, that's entirely based on the spike, that's probably not a test that you would put a lot of reliability on until we're certain that the targets within that gene are not affected by these mutations. Now, even those, like you're talking about right now, like you're doing, uh, those folks that are developing and working on those vaccines are constantly in development on those. So those are likely to be, uh, to be updated. What kind of time frame are we talking about? A month? Well, because of the way that these vaccines were developed, they can actually be fairly responsive to getting a, uh, a new version out, you know, a, an updated version of it. So I think right now they're still fairly confident that these mutations in the spike protein have not been affect, will not affect your responsiveness to the vaccines. But if it turns out that we get another variation that, that interferes more with the region of interest, they'd have to go back and redesign. And that may take several weeks to redesign. And, and but because they've done all the safety on the actual mechanism of the vaccine, it'll be much faster. Yeah. Uh, good point. And it helps people understand. We're talking about weeks. We're not talking about months. Yeah. And that's very much in contrast to something like flu. Because of the way the flu vaccine is designed, it takes months to, to process enough vaccine to be able to to vaccinate people. So if something were to change in the middle of the flu season, you would have, you know, more than half a year of development time before you could respond to that. The way that this one is done, it allows for very quick response when something changes within the virus. So it's a very nice advantage of this type of technology. So you ready to do some Q&A? Let's go. Okay, so the first one that I see here is John Tocho. John's saying, for me, all my labs look good. CGM is good. Uh, continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, I have mentioned many, if not all, as related to topics you cover. My biggest problem remains persist persistent high blood pressure as a risk and cofactor. So John, it, uh, you're similar to a lot of us, myself included. My blood pressure has continued to be an issue for me. I have to tell you, this sounds goofy but it has worked and it's been, once you start digging into the science on it uh, and the evidence, um, there's, there's clearly something there. There's a thing called Respirate. This company called me and sent me a, uh, their product. It's basically a breathing coaching device. And as you slow down your breathing, there are things that you do in terms of changing your, uh, your blood chemistry, specifically with, um, uh, bicarb, the bicarb ion in your blood, which changes a lot of other things and clearly does result in uh, some improvement in blood pressure. This thing has uh, been FDA approved, American Heart Association recommended. Uh, you can look it up on my channel or you can look it up on uh, uh, on the Respirate. Uh, uh, they have their own website. I, I don't know if you have any comments. That's a little bit, uh, that's in a maybe a little bit different area, Dave. Any comments? That's well within your space, outside of mine. Very good. Thanks. Bart Robinson, good morning, uh, Dr. Brewer and John. Looking forward as usual. This is uh, David, not John. My middle name is John, though. Oh, okay. Well, maybe he knew that. I didn't. Bob Weiss from the North Georgia Mountains. Wife and I are in vaccine group 1A, but organization of vaccine is giving a freaking disaster at the state level. Uh, welcome to the rest of our worlds. I mean, that's the problem. We, you know, we got geared up. We surprised ourselves. We broke all kinds of records. Prior to COVID-19, it took at least four years to develop a, a, the fastest vaccine development process was four years. We did it in less than a year for COVID-19. And you could quibble, maybe it was a little over a year, but we hit it a year. Now we get it out to the states and distribution is a major problem. You're going to see that recurring in these um, in these these comments today. Speaking of comments, there's uh, James West. I think some folks may know him, including you and me both. Yep. Good morning. Look Good morning. forward to being a listener this morning. 
Bambi Grage. Bambi's been uh, with us for quite a while. Good morning, Bambi. Good morning, uh, Dave Murphy. Uh, Martha Reich. Uh, I don't know if you know Martha Reich, do you? I don't, I don't think. She's James's aunt. She, oh. we, we grew our subscriber and viewer population uh, by at least one when James joined us, actually many more than that. Um, but one of them is Martha Reich. She's, um, she told us last week that she had started taking ivermectin. Um, she got it from the, uh, the horse preparation for ivermectin. She said uh, she was fine overall, except she started noticing that she kept wanting to back up to a fence post to scratch her backside. So <laughs> added a little humor to the, to the issues. John Tocho. John's very good at reminding folks. I forget about this. Hit the like button. When you hit the like button, uh, the the AI, the artificial intelligence that YouTube uses, picks that up and realizes that you know what, this is useful information. Maybe they should should suggest it to other people. Bill H. Any thoughts about the glymphatic system in the brain, as coined by Dr. Matthew Walker in Why We Sleep, which is the brain's method of removing toxins during sleep. I will say this, and then I'll hand it over to the expert. I loved that book, and I read it probably three or four times. Great book. So, David, uh, comments? This is a favorite subject of mine, actually. Um, I read the original work out of the University of Rochester some years ago um, from Jeffrey Isles. He was the original PI on some of this work. And this kind of touches back to what I was mentioning before about how the rest of our body has the lymphatic system to, to, you know, to remove and to cleanse from toxins and whatnot. But the brain doesn't, doesn't participate in that normal lymphatic system. What the glymphatic system does is it relies upon a deep restorative sleep to relax the gap junctions between the cells and the brain. And when that happens, it allows the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid to eliminate some of the toxins that we have in our brain. You see this in particular, and the research originally was done in mice that were, that were modified to have Alzheimer's disease. And you see an accumulation of tau protein when the mice don't get a restorative sleep. So we, having a good sleep pattern, having good sleep hygiene, means that you allow those gap junctions to relax slightly, and that allows the circulation of fluid that removes the toxins. Fantastic uh, finding, and it's continuing to be explored more and more as we understand more about how the brain uh, eliminates the toxins that develop through the course of the day. That's why, we're, that's why it's so important to get a good night's sleep, a good restorative sleep, uh, is it allows our brain to detoxify. And I've always had problems with sleeping. I'm getting, actually, I'm going in the, the, the reverse direction. Most people tend to uh, get worse sleep as they age. I'm getting better sleep. And I've always done, you know, the, the most common thing about sleep is just the simple sleep hygiene. You know, making sure you don't have technology with you. Make sure you don't have noise. Uh, I learned from that book to actually get... Um, uh, a uh, an eye shades, you know, these little eye things to put over because there's a huge difference. Our eyelids do let a lot of light through. Um, I learned to avoid is, what's that? I want to avoid the blue light. Avoid the so, blue light, which you see on uh, these devices. And these devices now, as a result of that, have a uh, have some blue light impacts. I've changed mine to. You know, at night, uh, gosh, what, six or eight o'clock, I, uh, it, the, you can see it sometimes where it changes from more of a blue tint to more of a, uh, a brownish or beige tint. Right. Um, a couple of things that have helped me recently. Um, number one, I've greatly increased my resistance training, especially in my thighs, you know, the large, uh, the larger muscle groups. And that has helped with sleep. So this, the hygiene, um, the large muscle groups, and again, go back to that respirate, slowing that breathing down and doing some other things in terms of uh, breathing and airway uh, control. Mm -hmm. Major improvements. 
You know, one thing that we do, David, is that we have these uh, larger programs uh, on Wednesdays, and then we go back and we'll take up chunks of the content and do a quick five minute um, video because, you know, when you go through looking at YouTube videos, who wants to take, oh gosh, that's a 90 minute one. I'm not going to look at that. But we cover a lot of things. And uh, Chris goes back to do that for us. Those have been some of our more popular videos. Chris and Aspen, I'm going to ask you guys to be sure and take a look at this comment and, uh, and David's response to this because sleep is so important to health. Any other comments before we move on? No, it's a great topic. Kay King, Doc, I have a cousin who's diabetic with an A1C of 11, will not take treatment because she believes it could be the medicines that cause people to have bad cardiovascular outcomes. Is there any truth to that? You know, I'm trying to, I saw this come in earlier and I, nothing came up. Um, I'm trying to... Uh, Think about what this person may be thinking about. David, are you? Is are you, is it ringing any bells with you? No, I, I'm assuming she means the the medications to lower her A1C. Yeah. So there's. Uh, you may remember the term. I'm having a senior moment. Just over the past five to ten years, one of the things that I, th I don't know who it is. Maybe the American Heart Association. Some of the groups have started saying is the one of the key. Uh, positive outcomes for managing diabetes is decreasing cardiovascular outcomes. So the new uh, diabetic treatments actually have cardiovascular outcomes as a part of how they're evaluated. And they're coming out showing improvement. So right. not sure what, I'm not tracking Kay King. I have no idea what they're, what they're talking about. John Osterholm was on local news here in Minnesota. So I didn't realize you were in Minnesota, John. Maybe I forgot. He was, uh, Osterholm was on local news just last night, extremely frustrated by the state's inability to roll out the vaccines to the public. Again, he's not the only one. In Minnesota, only a third of the vaccines that are in the state have made it into an arm. Uh oh, we're getting a lot of comments here. And so I may, uh, it, from a tech reason, I may have skipped some. Mahmoud Aid, MRS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, originally from Saudi Arabia. And I think that was the one. I think Osterholm had a, a whole chapter about that in terms of, um, of uh, endemicity uh, or uh, a common reservoir within the, uh, the camel population. And if you look at that part of the world, uh, you know, we all think from our own small slice of the world. And so if you're in America, you think, well, you know, yeah, I know I've seen the, uh, the typical stereotype of, of a camel in the Middle East. It's not a stereotype. Camels in the Middle East are more like horses in America. They're just, there's no way we're going to separate human and camel populations. So that is, David and I brought that issue up earlier. That's one of the reasons why there's constant continued risk from this other bad cousin. You know, I mentioned uh, COVID being the black sheep and David bringing up the point, well, it's not the only black sheep in that family, MERS being one of the others. Yeah. So Douglas D, hello folks. Douglas D, I plan on passing uh, on this and any vaccines. Douglas D, the key is what he just said, suppress your immune system. You can destroy COVID by doing this. Bre uh, breath work, I think is what you're looking at, and cold therapy. So that sounds a lot like, um, oh gosh, what's the name of the guy that, did, that ran the marathon in the Arctic without a shirt and barefoot? Wim Hof, that sounds a, lot, a little bit like Wim Hof. Breathwork, yeah. Miss, Mr. Y. Tully, statement and question part one. For COVID, why go down the road, route of looking at genes to help prevent? We know this affects elderly and compromised, not everyone across the board. Meaning, uh, well, before we get, well, 
meaning, meaning it is old genes, not necessarily a specific set of genes. Why not use all the resources going into these studies and test for vitamin D levels and send all vulnerable people? Uh, Dr. Zelenko's pro antiviral, one of these. Um, you can find bad genes, you're going to promote testing everyone's genes. So uh, I don't know so much that that is an immediate thing. Uh, however, it very well may be. Again, if somebody comes into the hospital, they're in the ER. If we had a rapid test um, showing whether or not someone is at risk for going into ICU, into the ICU, I think that could be incredibly helpful. Another thing that we didn't cover today is this whole thing about steroids. Steroids are very effective if you're one of those folks that's going to end up in the ICU. They're detrimental if you're not one of those people. So again, it's very, uh, steroids are a mainstay of this, of therapy for this problem right now, Mr. Wytelly. And um, we don't know, this is a, the potential way of knowing who the steroids would work for, who it wouldn't work for. Vaccine, coming from, from whose kids was injured by vaccine, from someone whose kids was injured by vaccine. Taking things that help get rid of metals and other toxic ad adjuvants are recommended. Vitamin C, zeolite, Tylenol is a bad idea. Felix. Felix has been on our show a couple of times. Good morning, Doc. He shared with the group that he's, um, how often, I don't know if you, you go there, David, because you're more of a lab scientist, but you work with a lot of us docs. How often have you seen somebody significantly reverse um, kidney disease? It's a rarity most of the time, but every once in a while. Felix is one of those guys huge improvement in his kidney function. And he shared that with the population. It makes such a huge difference for, for folks like Felix who will share with, uh, the, with others that, yeah, you know what? I'm a patient. I had this problem. I did the following things and it worked. It's not just some doc talking about ethereal stuff. Good to hear from you, Felix. Thanks for commenting. Here's Aunt Martha or James's Aunt Martha. What seems to be the issue when someone diets, low carb keto, and walking several miles a day, but never see any significant weight loss? Are there some people that this does not work? Well, here's a couple of points. Um, you start wrap, getting wrapped around a circular axle um, on this thing about, well, it's not calories, it's carbs. There's clearly reality to that. And uh, I strongly recommend looking at carbs if you can't, especially if you can't uh, uh, digest and metabolize them. And the older we get, the more of us can't digest and metabolize uh, carbs. That's, you know, if there were one thing I could accomplish uh, as a legacy thing, it would get people to recognize how prevalent pre-diabetes is and the impact that pre-diabetes has. It causes the, the plaque that we have. Yes, the plaque that we have in our arteries is made up of LDL, but it's not the concentration of LDL in the blood that's the problem. It's burning those insides of those arteries. It's the inflammation that David has looked for. <laughs> David's actually published on this with uh, Brad and Amy. Um, and I'll why don't, uh, why, don't, why don't I shut up for a minute, David, and let you comment on that? On the inflammation in the vasculature? Inflammation of the vasculature in association with, uh, with the insulin resistance. And then I'm going I'm to make another comment at the end of that. Yeah, we've, we've seen and published several different papers on a variety of different cytokines and inflammatory mediators, everything from HSCRP, uh, NPO, myeloperoxidase, uh, to show that, you know, when you get inflammation of the vasculature, you get deposition of oxidized, you know, lipids. That turns on macrophages. Those macrophages secrete more cytokines. And you end up getting this cycle of, of fire, uh, cycle of inflammation in the, in the vasculature that just leads to problems that um, you can reverse if you, if you go down the right kind of path and, and, try to mitigate the things that are driving that inflammation. 
So David uh, published with Brad and Amy a really good um, uh, article actually showing that it's not just, you know, the, the problems with, with gum disease and the mouth. Um, that's been known for a long time. Uh, you see billboards with it. The CDC has known about it, but there's never really been a, uh, an understanding of uh, which direction is this coming from? Is this the gum disease causing the heart disease or the diabetes or the heart disease uh, causing gum disease? The reality is it's coming both directions, but there's a, a bigger issue that's causing both, and that's the prediabetes. Mm -hmm. Now, Aunt Martha, as I do and David does as well, we both saw this as an opportunity to go down a bunny hole and uh, talk about some inflammatory stuff. But let me get back and make a very quick, hopefully practical uh, suggestion to your, to your question. The two most common reasons of not losing weight when you, uh, when you go low carb and you're walking like this are number one, stealth carbs, meaning, you know, things like lentils. A lot of people don't think of lentils as being full of carbs. They're full of carbs. Number two, or, or an, another big source of stealth carbs is people will get these cauliflower chips and they think, you know what, this is great. I'm taking a healthy alternative. And they never think to go back and look on the food label on the back and realize they put a little ground up cauliflower in potato chips. Most of this is coming from flour and potatoes. So, and it's full of carbs. So the, uh, Stealth carbs is one of the biggest problems here. The other big problem is just quantity. If you continue to eat quantity, you're still not going to burn it off. This thing about um, I can eat 7,000 calories, but so long as I'm keto, I'm going to continue to lose weight. That's an urban myth. You do get some decrease in the efficiency of the calorie burn, but not all people and really only up to 30% in some cases, but 10% in most cases. Uh, there's a fellow named uh, David Ludwig. He's a, uh, he's a big researcher in this space. He's at Harvard. He runs the, uh, uh, the, diabetes, uh, the obesity unit at Harvard. He's done a lot of research, and he, those are the numbers that he's coming up with. So you can't just eat 6,000 calories and say, well, because I'm on keto or carnivore, I can eat all the calories I want. David Murphy is a, is a, a friend and patient who has uh, shared his story on this group. And um, he, he shared, he, actually, David lost over 150 pounds. Dave Murphy did, not David Vigorous. Um, keto carnivore will lower her A1C without meds. It clearly will talking about the lady back at, at, with an A1C of 11. Chuck K, hi doc, have you seen the correlation between the consumption of seed oils and grains in the last hundred years and the rise of metabolic dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera? I have seen some of the comments on that. I'm not a major uh, seed oil uh, guru. I haven't gone that deep into it. I do think there is some evidence, but um, not that clear on it. David, have you have you looked in that space very much? I have not, no. Dave Murthy and Martha, I may, it may be that carbs are still too high. Keto done right, in my honest opinion, equals t total 20 carbs or less a day. So uh, uh, Martha, I, uh, Martha may be having a little bit of problem with her uh, system there. I'm a label reader. Carbs don't get past me. Okay, so it's probably not, uh, uh, not, uh, what's the word? Uh, stealth carbs may, may be just uh, an issue of total calories, Aunt Martha. I want to try the Freestyle Libre to find foods that cause glucose spikes, but Medicare won't pay for the sensors. So I will tell you this. I think, uh, I, you know, thanks for bringing it up, Martha. To me, there is nothing more important than um, to our health on a chronic disease perspective than uh, giving people a dashboard. This is critical information, and most of us have been driving blind without a dashboard our whole lives, and clearly everybody up until now. 
except those who those few people who are able to get access to a Dexcom. Now, uh, so the Freestyle Libre, the advent of that uh, ushered in a whole new uh, opportunity for us to begin to get an idea of what our blood sugar is looking like on a 24 hour a day, seven day a week basis and cheap. The Libre now will give you 14 days, 24 seven blood sugar reading. It's critical. If you haven't done it, you need to do it. I feel so strongly about it. I have, uh, I've worked with Michelle and we've got some opportunities where if you want to get that, if your doc won't prescribe it, we'll be happy to do it. Now, we don't pay for it for you. We can't get it for free and we can't change the insurance companies, whether it's Medicare or the, other, or the private insurers. They're all stuck on this idea that unless you're way bad diabetic or way advanced diabetic, maybe on insulin at a minimum, that you really don't need one of these. It's like, ah, oh, just one of the many areas where I disagree with insurance companies and the FDA. Yeah, so I don't think it, Go ahead. For those who are interested in, in you doing this for them, what does it cost them to get the freestyle? Uh, I think it uh, the freestyle itself is like 35 bucks to 70 bucks. Um, and again, I've paid for my own myself and uh, that's what folks have to. It used to cost up to 70 more often now it's like 35. Okay. That's not much at all. Yeah. The Dexcom, the Dexcom 5, 6, and now 7 coming up soon. The problem with the Dexcom is a couple of things. Number one, it's a little bit more complicated device. Number two, it's a, it's a lot more expensive. Dave Murphy has a comment about that. Good RX has coupons for the Freestyle Libre. In my area, I can get two for 60 bucks. John Tocho. Absolutely love my Freestyle Libre. It's been eye-opening, excellent baseline of information. I use it for the uh, for that period every month. Keeps me aware of what I'm doing. So we've had. I appreciate your uh, joining us today, David. We've uh, had a lot of a uh, lot of interesting comments, a lot of uh, interesting topics. Do you have anything uh, else you want to add before we sign off? I appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. Well, I tell you what, keep me posted on your schedule. We'd love to have you back. As you know, your, uh, your area of expertise overlaps quite a bit. So you've got a lot of information you can uh, share with our, our, with our folks. Speaking Absolutely. of our folks, I appreciate, um, I appreciate the interest that we've seen today. Oh, we've got one more question that Mr. Y. Tully was able to get uh, uh, inserted right before we leave. Brain detox, do you like far infrared sauna for detoxing brain? How about COVID prevention inducing fever? Um, I don't have a comment about COVID prevention. I do have a comment about uh, far infrared. I did take a look at that. Uh, in far infrared as well as um, uh, just regular uh, heat saunas, I think both are very, very helpful to health for different reasons. David, have you got any uh, comments on either of those items? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you again for your attendance and thanks to the others for, uh, for your interest. Thank you.